gather like this to worship your holy, your magnificent name, to look at your word and to study the scriptures, to learn more about you and what you have accomplished through your son, Jesus Christ. We can do so without fear of immense persecution, Lord. And we want to thank you for those men and women, those who are here today, uh, for their dedication, for their service to our country, and for the sacrifices that they made. And I just ask that you would continue to bless them, that you would continue to draw them closer to you through your word and through faith in your Son. God, I pray now that as we turn our attention to your word, that you would open up our spiritual eyes, our spiritual ears, and our hearts to receive the truth that you have for us, Lord. And I pray that as we look at this passage, that you would convict us of sin, but then you would also show us how we, as followers of your Son, Jesus Christ, can take this truth and further commit it to our lives, that we can build our lives and our church upon it in such a way that would bring glory to your name, and that as a result, that your that your kingdom here on earth would continue to grow and expand and your church would grow as people come to see the truth about who you truly are and what you've accomplished through your son, Jesus Christ. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you now. We want to thank you for your son, Jesus. We want to thank you for his perfect life. We want to thank you for his atoning death on the cross. We want to thank you for his victorious resurrection from the grave, and we look forward to his glorious return. Dear Heavenly Father, once again, we want to thank you for all that you've done for us, and we just pray this prayer in your son's powerful name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right, go ahead, open up your Bibles if you've not done so yet already. Acts chapter 14. Uh, we are going to be looking at the rest of the chapter, uh, verses 19 through 28. So Acts chapter 14, verses 19 through 28. It has been said that all good things must come to an end. And I am reminded of this expression. It seems to be that towards the end of every vacation that I go on with my family. Usually it gets to the end of the week and I realize, man, I had such a great time. But like, like the old, old expression goes, all good things must come to an end. And then on the return trip home, and we often drive to our vacation destinations. And so as I'm driving back, I often find myself thinking, man, the last time that I was in this particular town or last time I was at this exit or the last time I was at this gas station, I was going on vacation. I was heading into vacation. Now, wah, 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 I'm going home from a vacation. All good things must come to an end. And then sooner or later on that particular return trip, with this mindset, I find myself depressed, just wanting the return trip to be over, just wanting to be home in my own bed, and then planning my next vacation. Any of you do that on vacation? Okay, good. I just want to make sure I'm not alone there. Today in Acts chapter 14, verses 19 through 28, we are going to see that the same could be said of the Apostle Paul and Barnabas's first missionary journey, that all good things must come to an end. But what we are going to see in our text today is that their return trip was not wasted, nor was it wished away. Instead, we are going to see that Paul and Barnabas, that they exploited. And what I mean by that is that they took full advantage of their return trip to further advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is not to say that their return trip home was easy or a walk in the park but that on their way home, they continued to ministered, minister. And as they ministered to the people which they interacted with, God continued to work very powerfully in a very significant and amazing way. 
the only way, or the, in some ways that only God himself could be given, given glory and honor and praise for. So let's take a look at our text this morning, starting in verse 19. Towards the end of Paul and Barnabas' first missionary trip in verse, in verse 19, in the first part of verse 20, it is seen that the scene in Lystra, that's where we were at last week, that the scene there turned very quickly for Paul and Barnabas. One minute, the people there, they were praising them as Greek gods, as Zeus and Hermes. But then the next minute, we will see that they were persecuted as blasphemers. Let's read those, that, those verses. Verse 19, But Jews came from Antioch in Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city, and on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derby. According to verse 19, we see that there was this group referred to as the Jews. And presumably, these were the religious leaders and the influential Jews from the city of Antioch that we learned about earlier in the previous chapter, in Acts chapter 13, verse 50 as well as the violent mob that formed in Iconium. And we read about that particular group earlier in this chapter, in Acts chapter 14, verses 4 and 5. We see that these two groups of Jews, that they joined forces, and that they then went on to Lystra. They followed Paul there. And upon their arrival in Lystra, they persecuted or excuse me, they persuaded the people there concerning their opinion about Paul and Barnabas. Remember, they were just considered there by the people of Lystra to be the Greek gods, Zeus and Hermes. But upon the arrival of these two groups of Jews, we see that these opponents of Paul and Barnabas, that they were able to persuade the people there otherwise more than likely filling the people of Lystra, their minds, with hatred and scorn for Paul and Barnabas. And then this verse goes on to state that they stoned Paul. This was a form of capital punishment that was prescribed in the Old Testament in Leviticus chapter 24, verse 16, for blasphemers. These were individuals who who were believed to have misrepresented or spoken ill of Yahweh, that is, the one true God. And so as rocks then were being flung, were being hurled at Paul, Paul was apparently knocked out. He was unconscious. He very well could have fallen into a deep coma. And the Jews, if you look at that verse, at that verse right there, in verse 20, it says that, or excuse me, the very end of verse 19, it says that they supposed that Paul was dead. He was not indeed dead, but they supposed that he was dead. From the look of things, it appeared that Paul was deceased. So, the next verse right there, we see that, <clears throat> excuse me, um, after Paul's uh, supposed dead body was then dragged outside the city limits, and the reason why it was dragged outside the city limits is because anything that was dead or was unclean, according to Jewish law, would then spiritually contaminate that particular city and the people there. Therefore, the body had to be taken outside the city limits. But then it says in verse number 20 that once Paul's body got outside the city, that the disciples gathered about him. And so right here we see in verse 20 the Apostle Paul's remarkable recovery. This verse simply says that the disciples gathered about him and then he rose up. We're not told exactly what the disciples did to Paul and his body. 
And once again, these are the disciples. More than, it was definitely Barnabas, but it was also the recent converts there in Lystra who came to faith, who came to realize the truth about Jesus Christ through the message that Paul and Barnabas just had previously spoken. They had come to believe the truth about Jesus. And so here you have Paul, or here you have Barnabas, and here you have the recent converts to Lystra. And they're gathered about Paul and his body. Paul is still alive. They don't know that. And we don't exactly know. The text doesn't tell us what that entailed about the disciples gathering about Paul. I believe that more than likely the disciples there very well could have realized, hey, wait a minute, he's not dead. He's alive. They could have physically tended to his wounds. And undoubtedly, I would say that the disciples and Barnabas, that they prayed. They prayed to the one true God. That God would miraculously restore Paul's body, his health. And lo and behold, that's what happened. The disciples gathered around. And then the next thing that is said there in verse number 20 is that he rose up. So it's apparent that God was not done with Paul. God still had more things to accomplish through his servant. And that is what we see as we continue on in verse 20. God continued to work through the apostle Paul. It says that the very next day that Paul and Barnabas, they moved on to the next town, to Derby. Oh, can I get the map? Can I get it? I, there we go. All right. So, here we have our map that we've been looking at over the last uh, several weeks. And there's Lystra there. Do you guys see Lystra? You guys good? Thumbs up? Can I get thumbs up? All right, cool. So then, to the east of Lystra is, is this town, Derby. And this particular town, it's approximately 50, 55 miles away. And that is what we see Paul and Barnabas doing. The day after he was stoned, Paul moves up and he hikes on to the next town. And once they reach Derby, they do the same thing that they have done in the other locations, the other places, the other cities where they have, where, where they have stopped and they have ministered to. They apply the same ministry strategy. And that is simply go into the town and preach the gospel. Tell other people. Proclaim to them. Explain to them how Jesus is indeed the Son of God. How He is indeed the Savior. And how He has saved people from Satan's sin and death by dying on the cross for their, or for their sins. So that those individuals who believe in Jesus, they place their faith in Jesus, that they can be forgiven, that they can be spiritually transformed into one of God's children, and they can then enjoy life as it was intended to be lived. And then even after death, enjoy an eternity in God's immediate and glorious presence with the rest of God's people forever and ever. HCC, one of the things that we need to know, one of the things that the Bible makes absolutely clear is that God is totally sovereign. That God is in complete control of every aspect of our lives. This includes even the length of our lives. God, He is in control of how many days you are going to live on this earth. This is what King David said in Psalm 139, verse 16. He says, Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. HCC, neither you, nor anyone, nor anything else can shorten or lengthen the number of days that God has determined that you are to live. Let that be known. 
And God has numbered your days. He is in complete control of the span or the length of your life. So, if you have come here today and you have gone through some dark times, you have encountered some difficulties in your life, if you have been, quote-unquote, knocked down, but you're still alive, let it be known that God is not done with you. God still has some work to do in and through your life. If you are here and you are not a Christian, and you are alive, He desires for you to see the truth about who He is and who His Son is. He wants nothing more than for you to know that His Son Jesus is indeed Savior and Lord over all. If you're here today and you are a Christian and you've gone through some dark times, you've been knocked down, yet you're still alive, guess what? Just like the Apostle Paul, apparently he has a few more things that he wants to accomplish through you. So I don't want to belittle what you've gone through, but I'm going to say this. It's time for you to rise up, just like the Apostle Paul. And move on to your next God-given day. And be a good steward of it. Use it in such a way to bring glory to His name. To further His kingdom on earth. And to build His church. And just also as a side note, we as Christians, if we are aware of somebody who has gone through some difficult or some dark times, has been knocked down, especially if they've been persecuted because of their faith, their allegiance to Jesus Christ, I believe that we have a responsibility to gather around that particular believer and to minister to that particular believer. If there's some physical needs that we can tend to, that it's our responsibility to go ahead and to do that. But ultimately, we are to also be praying for them. We can minister, them, minister to them spiritually. That God would restore them, strengthen them, and give, and give them the courage to stand up and to move on to that next God-given day. Let's go back to our text in Acts chapter, in Acts chapter 14. Following Paul's remarkable recovery and their ministry in Derby. Verses 21 through 25 report on Paul and Barnabas' return trip home. This passage shows how they took full advantage of their return journey by going through each and every single one of the towns that they had previously been at and reinforcing the Christians and the churches there. Let's read that passage starting in verse 21 through 25. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. So as you can see in the map, they're basically retracing their steps. Verse 22, what did they do there in each one of these towns? They went there strengthening the souls of the disciples encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So after ministering in Derby, Paul and Barnabas essentially retraced their steps of the first missionary journey by going back to Lystra and then Iconium and then on to Antioch. And as they went, verse 22, in the ESV it says that they strengthened the Christians there individually and corporately. Individually, they strengthened the newborn Christians by encouraging them to persevere. We ought to remember in each one of these towns that Paul and Barnabas had previously ministered in, they had either been driven out of, they had fled from, 
or they had been persecuted, bodily harmed in. So all of these towns that they were going back to were actually hostile to the gospel and opposed to anyone who embraced this message. So their return trip was actually very courageous. I don't know about you, but if I was in Paul and Barnabas' shoes after Derba or after Derby, wanting to go home, I would have said, uh, let's go the other way, right? But that's not what they did. They went through each and every single one of those towns. And in each and every single one of those towns, they ministered to the Christians there individually and personally. In verse 22, the Paul and Barnabas sought to develop and cultivate perseverance within the Christians. They knew that the Christians who were actually in these particular towns were in a very hostile environment, and if they were going to survive, if their faith was going to endure, they needed to persevere. And so that was one of their main objections or objectives going back to these towns. And they did that by teaching in verse 22 that through many tribulations they must enter the kingdom of God. Now while a Christian's salvation and their eternal destiny has been eternally secured by God the Father through the sacrifice of His Son Jesus, Paul and Barnabas here warned the Christians that prior to their death, prior to their entrance into heaven, into God's immediate and glorious presence, that Satan and his demons, through the sin-laden world, would be set dead against them and be opposed to them at every step of the way. This is not a new teaching. This is not a new teaching that Paul and Barnabas came up with here on their return trip. This is actually a teaching that Jesus himself taught. In John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus told his disciples, In this life you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So with this teaching, Paul and Barnabas encourage the Christians in these towns that as they persevered through each one of these hardships, through each one of these tribulations, that they may, that may be placed in front of them because of their allegiance to Jesus Christ. As they persevered through each and every single one of those tribulations, they would be that much closer to heaven, to the end goal. HCC, we need to know that in this world that we currently live in, just like Jesus taught, that we will have tribulations. In the passage that Tom read just a little bit earlier, the Apostle Paul, later on in his life, he's writing one of his apprentices, one of his dis- excuse me, disciples. And he says to Timothy in verse 12, Indeed, All who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So one of you could say the promises that Jesus has given every believer, and that is reiterated in the New Testament epistles, is that if you are indeed a faithful follower of Jesus Christ, that at some point in your journey, as you head towards that last day that God has sovereignly determined. At some point along the way, you will be persecuted. You will be mocked. You will be ridiculed. You will be whatever it is due to your association with Jesus Christ. We need to be aware of that. And I think that we have begun to sense that a little bit more over the last year and a half or so. But now here's the question. And the question is, where does one find the strength? Where does one find the ability to endure in face of the persecution? How does one have and find the ability to persevere? I believe that the answer lies in knowing that Jesus, through 
his death and resurrection, that he has indeed overcome the world. And that through his death and through his resurrection, he has proven himself to be infinitely greater and more powerful than Satan, sin, and even death. And so when we are faced with a tribulation, whenever we are persecuted due to our faith, we must place ourselves under Jesus' omnipotent, all-powerful care. And that means essentially doing what he has instructed us to do in those moments. This means that we need to, as Jesus told his listeners on the Sermon on the Mount, that we need to turn the other cheek. That there's times when we definitely need to be loving and praying for our enemies. And there's even other passages in the New Testament that, inst- uh, that instructs Jesus' believers, instead of trying to exact a justice on your own, that we need to be trusting in God to, uh, to avenge whatever wrongdoing was placed in our path and, and in our way. And as we faithfully follow, as we faithfully obey Jesus in those difficult times, I believe that he will enable us to faithfully endure whatever is placed in front of us, whatever hardship we are facing. And we'll be able to say just as David did in Psalm 28, verse 7, The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts, and I am helped. My heart exalts, and I am with the song, and I give thanks to him. So we see here that as Paul and Barnabas retraced their steps on their return home. They went through each and every single one of these towns, and they encouraged the believers there to persevere in the face of tribulation. We also see that as they went from town to town, that they also sought to strengthen the churches there by establishing leadership within each and every single one of those communities. Take a look down there back in Acts chapter 14. Take a look at verse number 8, or excuse me, 2023. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. A key feature of any biblical local church is biblical leadership. In the New Testament, in passages like 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1, in these passages here, they clearly identify the office of elder. And this particular word elder is also synonymous with the term overseer as the main human leaders of the church of each and every single local church. Who is the head of the church, though? It's Jesus. But underneath Jesus, here on earth, every and any biblical church is to be led by a group of men referred to as elders. The Bible instructs every elder then to spiritually provide and then also spiritually protect the community of believers that they have been entrusted with. What does this mean? This means, first of all, that elders, that they are to spiritually provide. Provide what? They are to spiritually provide guidance. They are to come together and they are to determine. I believe, we believe that the church that we have been entrusted with is to head in this particular direction. Pursue this particular goal or project. Not only are they to provide guidance, but also care. Many of you have been cared for by our elders here in our church. Some of us have come upon hard times. And one of the things that the elders are instructed to provide in the Bible is care. Care for the members of the community who are hurting emotionally or spiritually 
or even physically oversee that their particular needs are taken care of. Most importantly, elders, they have been commissioned to provide nourishment, spiritual nourishment to the church that they are entrusted with, that they oversee. And this comes through primarily the consumption of God's Word, through the teaching, through the preaching, and through the application of God's Word, the truth there to the lives of the believers. Not only are spiritual leaders to spirit, or not only are our elders to spiritually provide, but they are also to spiritually protect the community of believers that they've been entrusted with. They are to oversee that the teaching is indeed biblical, that it comes from the scriptures, that it is indeed the truth. And they are to protect the Christians from false teaching and from also sin, sinful behavior, sinful attitudes that try to creep their way into every single community. So in verse 23, Paul and Barnabas are seen establishing elders in the churches of the towns that they revisited. They recognized that if the churches were to survive in these harsh conditions, in these spiritually tough atmospheres, they recognized that leadership within these communities, within these churches, was absolutely vital. HCC, the Bible teaches that we too are to be elder-led. The Bible teaches that we are not to be solely pastor-led. Some of you right now are saying, praise the Lord. (laughs) The Bible also teaches, though, that we are not to be entirely congregationally led. I do believe that in the scriptures you do find churches, local churches coming together and coming to a consensus on a particular matter and then being led by the elders going down that particular road, that particular direction. But once again, the Bible is clear that every local church is to be elder-led. And so we here at HCC, we are blessed to be led, to be led by the spiritual leaders. This is, you could say, our elder board. This is a group of men who qualify to the standards that are set forth in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1. And these are the men whose primary responsibilities it is to spiritually provide and also spiritually protect all of you here within our church. And so we, as a church, we need to be praying for our spiritual leaders. We need to be praying for our elders. One of the things that I am excited about is that we very recently, as uh, elder board, as the spiritual leaders, that we are beginning to work on what is right now being referred to as shepherd groups. And so what is going to happen is that each spiritual leader, they are going to be assigned, you could say, a uh, HCC member or regular attendee, and it's going to be their responsibility to reach out to all of the people that are underneath their care directly throughout the year. It's going to be their responsibility to be praying for those particular individuals and families that are part of their shepherd groups. And it's going to be their primary responsibility to when they do reach out and they do contact the scene, if there is a specific need that that particular person or family is in need of and how we as a church can address that particular need. So be praying for our spiritual leaders here, for our elders. I believe that these particular men here are absolutely key as we continue to do ministry within the context of our church in the upcoming years. Let's go back to our passage. After retracing their steps of the first missionary journey, by strengthening Christians and churches along the way, verses 26 through 28 detail 
Paul and Barnabas' return home to Antioch. In Antioch, they were reunited and they regathered with the believers there. And the church there, the believers there, they could be referred to as the base church or their sending church. These are the ones which they base their ministry out of. This is the church that sent them out onto this first missionary trip. And as Paul and Barnabas returned and regathered with this community, they presented to them a redeeming report. Let's read about that report, starting in verse 26. From there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. And when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they remained no little time with the disciples. Over the previous two years, this was the approximate length of time that the first missionary journey took. Paul and Barnabas, they accomplished a lot. They traveled over 1,200 miles. Through their preaching, a multitude of people were saved. And through their ministry, multiple churches were established. This is how Paul and Barnabas could have presented their missionary report. But this wasn't exactly how they reported it. Instead, Paul and Barnabas, their redeeming report, told what God had accomplished through their endeavors. Look at verse 27. And when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that they had done, right? Oh, no, that's not what your text says. Oh, that's right. It says, they declared all that God had done with them. Paul and Barnabas just like in Lystra last week, they desired to turn the spotlight on to direct the church's attention and admiration towards the one who was truly, ultimately responsible for the salvation of those individuals and for the establishment of the churches that they had planted. They knew, Paul and Barnabas, they were well aware of the fact that they could not take any credit for what took place over the previous two years. They recognized that they were just simply vessels or instruments to be used at God's pleasure for his glory. HCC, God is never idle. He is always powerfully at work revealing himself in some significant way and accomplishing his magnificent will on earth. Now sometimes, and I would say unfortunately, due to spiritual blindness or sin or just the fact that we're so busy, God's work goes unnoticed. And so I pray that we, not just here at HCC, but just Christians in general, that we would become more spiritually aware to God's doings and his work in our lives and in the lives of others. But then there's other times where God's work, it is apparent, where it is noticed. And in those moments, I believe that we as Christians, we have a responsibility. We have the opportunity, I should say, to take that good news and to direct people's attention towards it. And as we see what God is doing within our midst, and as we take others' attention and direct it towards them, we'll be accomplishing two things. We'll be encouraging each other. We'll be able to say, oh my goodness, take a look and see what God is doing here within our church, within our congregation. See how he's not just growing our church, but how he's spiritually maturing our church as well. And not only will we be encouraging each other, but also at the same time, there will be those individuals who are a part of our community who even, unbeknownst to us, may not be saved. And in essence, what we'll be doing is we'll be evangelizing them as well. We'll be forcing them to see, to come to the truth that God is powerfully at work. HCC. 
We cannot let any opportunity go to waste. This is one of the things that we have seen over the past several weeks here as we've gone through Paul and Barnabas's missionary journey. We need to exploit, we need to take advantage of every situation to advance and to promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as we do so, don't let the spotlight be turned on and kept on you. If you ever find yourself in that position, it's time for us and it's an opportunity for us to take that spotlight to turn it on to the one who truly matters. And that is Jesus Christ, right? Over the next few weeks here, next month and a half even, we're going to be getting together with family for the holidays and friends for Christmas, so on and so forth. And what are you going to do during those times? Are you going to just simply let those opportunities go, you know, come and then pass on? Or are you going to take advantage of those opportunities as you reunite with loved ones that you haven't seen in a while? You can be able to tell them what God has been doing in your life. And I pray that as you do so, that God would be powerfully at work in that particular conversation and open up the spiritual eyes, ears, and hearts of those people that you're talking to about who He truly is and who His, and who his Son truly is as well. Let us pray. Generally, Father, we come before You today, Lord. We just want to thank You once again for all of the blessings that You have placed into our lives God, I just pray now that you would be with us as we go from this place. I pray that you would give us opportunities to share the good news about your Son. And I pray that as we, do, as we are faithful to that particular call, that you would be powerfully at work in our listeners' lives. And I pray that we would be able to see you at work and that we would be able to then take that particular report and report it to each other here, and we would be encouraged by it, and that we would be even motivated to go back out and to do it again. Dear Heavenly Father, ultimately, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the salvation that we have by your grace through faith in Him and Him alone. And God, I pray that we would be able to take this good news and share it with others. Just pray this prayer in your Son's powerful name, Jesus Christ. Amen. HGC, as we conclude our worship service today, I ask that you please rise.